Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with pumpkin seed brittle. That's right, we don't do a lot of candy videos, but I thought since we are getting close to America's biggest candy holiday, sorry Easter, of course I mean Halloween, I thought we'd do the seasonal take on classic peanut brittle. And besides the pumpkin seeds, what makes this very appropriate for a Halloween treat is that it's very scary to make. It's an extremely dangerous if you're not careful. So let's keep that in mind as we get started. And the first step here is we're gonna add a little bit of sugar to a heavy bottom saucepan. All right, it's very important you use something heavy duty here. No thin cheap pans, please. And to the white sugar, we're gonna add some corn syrup. And of course, this is just regular corn syrup, not the evil high fructose corn syrup, which really you should not eat, ever. And then we'll also add a little splash of water. And then we're gonna take a spatula and give that a mix until basically all that sugar looks wet. Okay, so keep stirring until it looks like that. And when that's done, the coast is clear to go ahead and add our butter. So I have five tablespoons of unsalted butter. And then what we're gonna do is bring this to a boil on medium high heat. And that's definitely gonna take a few minutes to happen. So while we're waiting, we're gonna to wanna to make sure we have a couple other things ready to go. The first of which would be our baking soda. Very, very critical here. You're also gonna to wanna to have a whisk handy and some kind of sheet pan lined with a silpat. Word on the street is that you can also use parchment paper, although I've never tried that. And I'm also gonna have a second one handy to put over the top of the brittle so I can press it nice and flat, okay? And of course, you're gonna need some pumpkin seeds. And for this, we're using raw pumpkin seed, which have that beautiful, beautiful green color. And to those seeds, I'm also gonna add some coarse sea salt. And by the way, I know that looks like a ton, but that's because it's such a large grain. And we'll talk about that in the blog post, so don't get nervous. So make sure you get all that stuff organized ahead of time. And at this point, we can go back and check our sugar mixture, which should be boiling. And by the way, please feel free to use a bigger saucepan than this. I'm always trying to use what will film the best, not necessarily what will work the best. So I definitely could have used a little bigger pot here. Although it did work, I did want to point that out. So we're going to keep it on the heat. We're going to keep stirring. And eventually it will start to turn kind of a tan color. And eventually it will start to darken, as you can see right here. Although that's still a little pale, we want it to get a little darker than that, a little more caramely. So I'm going to keep it on the heat until we have something that looks like this. And of course you can go by temperature and use a candy thermometer. I don't personally, mostly because I don't have a candy thermometer. But the good news is just using your eyes will work perfectly. And if you want, when you think you're getting close, you can turn the heat down to medium so things don't happen quite so fast. But bottom line, you wanna keep it cooking until we have something that looks like this. And when it gets to that point, we're gonna go ahead and turn off the heat and whisk in very carefully, whisk in our baking soda. So we will sprinkle in the baking soda, whisking constantly, and be very, very careful. This is gonna increase in volume. It's gonna kind of foam and bubble up, which is one reason I really should be using a bigger pan here. I came about a half inch away from a mess of epic proportions, and that's because that baking soda is creating billions and billions of tiny, tiny bubbles, which is gonna give this its signature brittle texture. All right, this is called pumpkin seed brittle, not pumpkin seed super hard rock candy. So like I said, the baking soda is key, and as soon as that's been stirred in, we're gonna quickly dump in our pumpkin seeds, grab our spatula, and stir that in quickly. But quick doesn't mean unsafe, so be very careful. But anyway, we're gonna quickly and safely stir in those seeds, at which point we'll transfer that onto our prepared baking sheet. And we'll spread it out a little bit. And then I'm gonna take my second sill pat, lay that over the top, and simply press it down. And for me, I like to do that with this heavy cast iron casserole dish, which does a nice job of pressing. Of course, any flat object will work. You could simply use a small saute pan, do the same thing. Although right here, I got a little close to the edge and some squeezed out. So I simply took a small knife, since this is not hardened yet, and just cut it off. And I want to be clear, I'm doing that not because it would have caused any problems, but because I wanted to taste it. But anyway, we're going to press that flat. And as you'll see, this stuff is going to harden up very, very quickly. So I gave mine about 30 seconds, and I peeled back that top sill pat. And at this point, you can just let it cool completely and break it up into irregular pieces. But if you want to do some nice, neat squares or triangles or whatever, you have a very short couple minute window, while this is still a little bit soft, to take a knife and score it. Now, a couple things here. Using a knife to cut on a sill pad is incredibly stupid, but this knife is incredibly dull, and also you really don't need to go all the way through. You're basically just scoring this so you can go ahead and snap it off later. So I'm gonna go ahead and score mine into squares, and then all I'm gonna do is let this cool completely, at which point I can start breaking you off a little something something. And by something something, I mean amazingly delicious pumpkin seed brittle. And as I mentioned, you certainly don't have to do any certain shapes. Traditionally, this is just snapped into irregular pieces. But that's really up to you. You are the YA tittle of your pumpkin seed brittle. And at that point, we're pretty much done, except of course you should transfer this into some container appropriate for the occasion. 
So I decided to use a small wooden coffin. And where did I get that? Uh, trust me, you don't want to know. And I know it doesn't look that scary in the broad daylight, but if you dim those lights and put a little jack-o'-lantern next to it, oh man, that would be terrifying. But no matter the presentation, you are in for a fantastic sweet treat. So anyway, let me go in for the official taste. And if you're worried about all that sugar, don't. Pumpkin seeds are like a superfood. So when you take sugar and you add a superfood, they basically cancel each other out. And it's just like none of this ever happened. Okay? So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Honeycomb toffee. That's right, this beautiful confection goes by many names, including cinder toffee, sponge candy, and some people even call it hokey pokey. Although I probably would have went with holy poly. But anyway, no matter what you call it, this homemade candy is very easy to make. Although please don't confuse easy with not dangerous. Okay, this is a procedure we have to be very careful with. But if somehow we can manage not to horribly burn ourselves, this really is a fun and simple recipe to make. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by prepping a few things we have to have ready before we head to the stove. And that's gonna include some kind of parchment lined baking dish, or if you want, you could oil some foil, but I do find parchment works best for this. And then besides that, we're also gonna to wanna to measure out our baking soda, as well as have on hand a heat proof silicone spatula. Okay, so we definitely wanna have that stuff set up ahead of time before we move on to start the actual recipe. And for that, what we're gonna need is some white sugar, to which we will add a little bit of corn syrup. And I know you're a little nervous, but relax, this is not high fructose corn syrup. This one's only a little bit bad for you. And then we will also add in a little touch of honey, which by the way is not included in most recipes, but I do like the flavor it gives. And it is called honeycomb after all. And then last but not least, we'll add a little touch of water. And we'll go ahead and take a whisk and give that a mix. And then what we'll do is go ahead and head to the stove where we'll place this over medium heat. And as this comes up to temperature, it's going to turn from kind of a thick sludge into something that's thinner but still cloudy. And once it does get to this stage, we can just lose the whisk. And we'll just let it go the rest of the way without stirring. And what's going to happen is that mixture is going to clear up and start to bubble. And what we're going to do is cook it until it reaches a temperature of 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, not Celsius. 300 Celsius would be a little too hot. And I didn't really have time to show it but I was definitely checking with a probe thermometer. And in the blog post, I will give you a few tips on how to monitor the temperature. But anyway, like I said, we're gonna cook that until it's 300 degrees Fahrenheit, at which point it should look a little something like this. And once we've reached our target temp, we'll go ahead and pull that off the heat and make the magic happen. And all we need to do here is dump in our baking soda and whisk it for a few seconds until it's just incorporated. And be cautious because it will bubble up. And then as soon as we have that mixed in, we will quickly switch to our spatula and very, very carefully transfer that onto our parchment paper. Okay, this stuff will burn you severely if you touch it or it splashes on you. So you are responsible for yours and everybody around you's safety. I mean, you are after all the Steve Jobs of your dangerously hot blobs. So transfer that in carefully and thoughtfully. And by the way, do not under any circumstances try to spread that out with the spatula. Okay, we don't wanna compress this at all because you're gonna ruin the bubbles. So bottom line, we just basically dump it in, and then we wait, and wait. Okay, at least 30 minutes, or however long it takes for this to cool completely. And then once it is cooled completely, and theoretically rock hard, we'll go ahead and remove that from the dish, and break it up, starting with the old drop it on the table trick, which if it's cool enough should cause it to crack. And that's it, I went ahead and broke it up. And then I layered all those pieces up for a nice provocative photo, so you can get a great view of what exactly happened which was our baking soda activated by the heat, forming hundreds of thousands of bubbles, which basically turn what would be hard rock candy into something that's very light and crisp and basically melts in your mouth. And I try not to do a lot of eating sounds because some people are kind of put off, but I did hear so you could hear that crunch. Oh yeah. So this stuff sounded right and tasted right and had the right texture. And I should have been satisfied and stopped, but I didn't. Since I had the ingredients, I decided to try another batch using twice as much baking soda, which I had heard gives you even more volume and a more pronounced honeycomb appearance, as well as even more of that signature addictive melt-in-your-mouth texture. So that's what you're seeing here with batch number two. 
Same exact procedure and ingredients, but with, like I said, twice the amount of baking soda. And it really didn't look that much different, but there did seem to be a little larger volume. And again, I cannot stress enough how careful you have to be with this stuff. All right, most people think third degree burn is the worst, but it's not. This will actually cause a fourth degree burn, which is the same as a third degree burn, except you have molten hot rock candy fused to your skin, which continues burning for what seems like 20 to 25 minutes. So unless you're tired of having fingerprints, please be careful. But anyway, I transferred batch number two in and let it cool. And I went ahead and broke that one up so I could compare. Oh, and by the way, punching it to break it up is not recommended. I almost split open a knuckle there. And as far as appearances go, the second batch did look much better. Okay, a lot more bubbles and it wasn't quite as flat. And it really did look more like a honeycomb. And I know some nerds in the audience are like, wait a minute, those aren't hexagons. All right, take it easy. You're right. We're using the term loosely here. So with the second batch, the appearance was better. And it was just as crisp. But there was one small issue. This batch did have a little bit of baking soda aftertaste. Okay, it was subtle, but it was there. So when comparing these two batches, we're presented with a classic culinary philosophical debate. Is it better to have something that looks good and tastes great, or something that looks great and tastes good? But before you answer, I should probably mention, we could just split the difference and maybe have the best of both worlds. So I might have to do a third batch. And if I do, I will pass along the results. But anyway, that's it. The technique for making honeycomb toffee. Whether you eat this as is, or cover it in chocolate to simulate a fairly famous candy bar, as long as you promise to avoid fourth degree burns, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Rocky Road. That's right, I thought I was gonna show you how to make a famous candy based on a famous ice cream. But as it turns out, it's actually the other way around. The ice cream flavor was actually inspired by an Australian candy that goes by the same name, which used the same signature ingredients of chocolate, marshmallows, and nuts, and probably a little touch of Vegemite. But regardless, this is super easy to make and would make for an absolutely wonderful edible gift for the upcoming holidays. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with a bowl full of chocolate chips. And please do me a favor and use dark chocolate. Okay, I think the only way to mess this up is to use milk chocolate. And of course, we always want to taste a little bit to make sure it's okay. And then to our chocolate chips, we will add some cubed up unsalted butter. At which point I do like to give this a quick mix. Since we're going to melt all this over hot water, and I feel like some of the butter should be underneath and not just sitting all on top. And then last but not least, we'll add a couple teaspoons of maple syrup, which I believe is supposed to be corn syrup. Except I don't stock that. So I'm going with the maple syrup, which seems to work out just fine. And then what we'll do is place that over a saucepan that has about an inch of hot water set over the lowest heat setting you have. Okay, a few tiny bubbles here or there are okay, but we don't want this boiling or simmering. And that's it, we will just leave that to gradually melt. And please do not try to stir this too early. Okay, you might see some of the butter and a few of your chocolate chips start to melt and you'll get all excited. And you'll want to give it a stir, but don't. We want this all melted before there's any movement. And while we're waiting for that, we can review our two other main ingredients, which would be some kind of nuts plus mini marshmallows. And as far as the marshmallows, I'm going to use two kinds. Some little white ones that are basically white sugar flavored. And then I found some pink ones that I cut up, which I believe are pink sugar flavored. And then as far as the nuts go, I like a nice roasted whole salted almond. But of course, if you'd rather use something else, go ahead. I mean, you are after all the highway patrol of what goes in our Rocky Road mixing bowl. And things like peanuts or walnuts or cashews will also work beautifully. And then the other thing we should prep ahead of time is to plastic wrap an 8 inch by 8 inch cake pan, which I've done here. And that's it, by now we can go back and check our butter and chocolate, which as you can see is nice and melty. And once that's happened, we can take a spatula and give this a mix. Okay, going a little bit slowly at first. And then as all that butter emulsifies in, we can go ahead and stir a little more quickly until we end up with this relatively soft, sort of shiny, fudgy looking mixture. And that's it, we'll go ahead and remove that from the heat and quickly stir in our nuts and marshmallows. And don't pull a muscle, but we do wanna mix this up fairly quickly, since as you know, when melted chocolate cools, it thickens up. And by the way, pink and brown is a very, very underrated color combination. So if you can find those, I think they do make a nice addition. As of course, with anything else you decide to throw in this. 
All right, other kinds of nuts, dried fruit, etc. Okay, as long as you keep the same proportions between the chocolate and the chunks, really anything goes. And then what we'll do once we're confident everything has been completely coated is quickly transfer that into our pan. And while we do want to make sure everything's pushed into the corners and that we end up with a nice, consistent, even layer, we do not under any circumstances want to smooth out and press down the top. All right, this stuff is called rocky road, not uneven pavement. So we want to try to preserve a rough as possible texture on the top. And that's it once that's been spread out and definitely not smoothed over. We will simply let that cool down to room temp before covering it with some plastic and then popping it in the fridge until it's very, very well chilled and firm, which is going to make it so much easier to cut as you're about to see. So once our rocky road has been thoroughly chilled, we'll take it out of the fridge and remove it from the pan. And I'm not sure how familiar you are with actual rocky roads, but having grown up in the mean streets of Shortsville, New York, believe me, I was around my fair share of them, and they tend to be very dusty and dirty. I mean, come on, you can't run one of those street cleaners on a road this rocky. Which is why before slicing, I like to sprinkle some cocoa over the top. And then what we'll do once we've dirtied that up a little, is take a long thin knife, and we'll carefully cut this up into 16 pieces. Which as you can see, I like to do right on the plastic. Although there are pros and cons to that method. Right, the main pro is it's going to be a lot easier to clean my cutting board. But the main con is you might get some plastic stuck underneath the candy. And people spitting out pieces of plastic is never a great look. So once you cut this, be careful to look for that. And if we use the perfect proportion of chocolate and nuts and marshmallows, you should get some beautifully clean cuts. All right, check it out. I find this stuff absolutely gorgeous. Not to mention incredibly addictive to eat. Okay, I'm really not a big sweets guy and almost never eat candy. But once you start with this stuff, it's hard to stop. And I think the secret here is that play between the really sweet marshmallow and then that bittersweet dark chocolate. Of course, elevated texturally by those salty, crunchy roasted almonds. Right, so simple yet so satisfying. So I very much enjoyed that first one. And then I went ahead and arranged some on a platter so I could take some pictures. And of course, eat another one. And I don't mean to surface shame people, but here you can get a great look at why we really do want to leave that top as irregular and rough as possible. I mean, to me, that just completes the proper visual effect. Speaking of which, after I finished that second piece, I went ahead and stacked these up for some more pictures. As is required by the Food Blogger Commandments, Okay, when it comes to cookies or candies or bars, thou shall stack. But anyway, whether you're going to make these for yourself, or maybe to give as an edible gift, or hopefully both, I really do hope you give these a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Tarone! That's right, there's nothing wrong with eating a little candy once in a while. Especially when it's this delicious and beautiful. Not to mention based on a recipe that predates the Roman Empire. But above and beyond the great taste, great looks, and historical significance, this recipe is also perfect for those of you that really love stirring. Since we are going to do a lot of that, like for about an hour and a half, but it's going to be totally worth it. Plus, time flies when you're having fun. And to me, and hopefully you, this is fun. So let's go ahead and get started by making sure we have the following things ready before we even start this recipe. The most important of which would be our roasted nuts. And luckily my oven's broken, so I had an excuse to buy some beautiful roasted, peeled Spanish almonds, as well as some roasted pistachio, which I definitely have one too many of. And then besides the nuts, we're also going to want to separate two eggs, because about a half hour from now we're going to need some beaten egg whites. And that's going to be a lot easier to do if they're at room temp, okay? And then besides that, we'll also grate a little bit of lemon zest, and that's pretty much it for the stuff you have to do ahead of time. As far as ingredients, that is. Another thing we're definitely going to need to do before we start is get our pan prepped. So what I have here is a plastic lined baking dish, plus a couple pieces of what's called wafer paper, which is optional but does make this so much nicer. So I have two pieces, one that's going to go in the bottom, and then one that will be pressed on top. And usually it's made out of rice, and sometimes actually sold as rice paper, which can be a little confusing, because this is definitely not the same stuff you make spring rolls with. But anyway, we'll talk about that stuff on the blog. For now, once we have all that stuff together, we can actually start the recipe. So let's go ahead and add some honey to a heavy bottom pot. And I prefer something on the lighter side. I'm using what's called a light amber honey. So that's my recommendation, but I'm pretty sure any honey will work. And then to that, we will add a little bit of sugar before grabbing a heavy duty spatula and heading to the stove, where we are gonna place this over low heat and we will start stirring. And we will continue to stir and stir and stir 
cooking over low heat for 30 minutes. And during that time, our mixture is going to turn from something that's kind of golden and grainy to something paler but much smoother. And while technically we are going to tell you to stir this continuously, I don't necessarily mean that literally. You can stop stirring every once in a while and take a few seconds break. Nothing tragic will ensue, but we really do want to keep it moving pretty much the whole time. And after 30 minutes of cooking down low, your mixture should look something like this. And at this point, we're going to stop and add our egg whites, which, by the way, we need to beat to soft peaks first. So if you are making this with a friend, one of you can stir while the other one does the eggs. Or if you're making this alone, no big deal. Because our egg whites are at room temp, it's only going to take a couple minutes to whip, and our honey mixture should be fine. If you're afraid, I guess you could turn the heat off until you're done. But like I said, it shouldn't be a problem. So what we'll do is we'll throw a big pinch of salt into our room temp egg whites and take a whisk. And like I said, we want to whip those to soft peaks. Don't over whip them. We want to get to what I like to call the shaving cream stage. Okay, so something that looks just about like that. And then what we'll do with our heat still on low is we will whisk those egg whites into our honey mixture one whiskful at a time. So we will add a little bit and we will whisk that in until it disappears and then continue on in three or four more additions until all those egg whites have been incorporated. And as you'll notice, this is really going to lighten up the mixture. And by the way, I should mention the method we're using here is the very slow, very ancient technique. Okay, the modern method for this is to make a very hot sugar syrup and then simply incorporate that into your finished meringue. But while way, way faster, I much prefer this method, as you will hopefully read about on the blog. So I just wanted to mention that in case you read comments to the effect of, hey, why aren't you using the method that only takes 15 minutes? I have my reasons. So we will continue with the whisk until all our egg whites are incorporated, at which point we want to switch back to our spatula, or in my case, heat-proof spoonula, and then all we need to do is continue cooking, stirring pretty much constantly, for another 40 minutes or until done. And one thing I want you to keep an eye on to help determine when that is, you see how when I lift the spatula up, and that mixture kind of forms ribbons that disappear into the surface almost immediately? We're going to keep an eye on that, because as this mixture cooks, a couple things are going to happen. It's going to turn a brighter and brighter white, and you'll notice those ribbons will go from disappearing almost immediately to this stage, where they kind of sit on top of the surface for a couple seconds, and then as you'll see near the end, they'll eventually stay on the surface for like four or five seconds. So that's generally how I can tell we're getting very close. But there is another great test where you just drip a little bit of the mixture in some cold water. And as soon as it cools, you can kind of feel how firm your mixture is going to be when it's done. And what I'm going for is something that feels sort of like a firm clay. So this was close. It was just a little too soft. So I kept cooking and stirring for about, like I said, 40 minutes or so until my mixture looked like this. Okay, check out the ribbons. You see how they're holding their shape? and they're staying visible up on that surface for like four or five seconds, that for me tells me I'm done. And once we've determined it's cooked long enough, we will stop and add the rest of the ingredients. So I'm gonna add a little touch of vanilla, as well as our lemon zest. And by the way, if you want, you could also add some dried fruit into this. You are the boss of making this Tyrone your own. So we'll stir that in, followed by our roasted nuts. And one pro tip here, this is much easier if your nuts are warm. Okay, if we dump in room temp or, God forbid, cold nuts into this, this mixture is going to get really hard really fast and it's going to be very difficult to get into your pan. So I like to reserve the nuts in a warm oven, which makes a mix in here much easier. And as soon as all that's incorporated, we're going to quickly transfer this into our prepared dish and spread it out and press it down the best we can. And it's probably not a bad idea to switch to a new clean spatula at this point, which I believe I should have sprayed with oil first, but I forgot. That's okay. Nothing that can't be washed and or licked off. So we will press in and spread out that mixture as evenly as possible. And then we'll top that with our second piece of wafer paper. Which, by the way, has a dull side and a shiny side. And I think we want the shiny side up. And then we'll go ahead and we'll give that a little pressing. Which I always think I need to put a little plastic down first to protect it from my sweaty hands. So we'll give that a little press. And while we do want to press firmly, be careful, the paper will rip. I kind of tore mine a little right there, but that's okay. When we cut it, no one's going to know. And if you want, the hand's probably sufficient. But just to be safe, I do like to give it a little extra press with this meat pounder. And then once our mixture has been transferred in and properly pressed, we'll simply leave it out for an hour or two until it cools completely, at which point it will be nice and firm and ready to cut. So I let mine sit for a couple hours before removing it from the pan, which, thanks to my plastic wrap, came out quite easy except the plastic had fused to my Tironi around the edges, and I realized it was going to take about 20 minutes to peel that off. 
So I got frustrated and decided to just cut it off. So I took a serrated knife and using a nice long sawing motion, sliced through, revealing what has to be one of the most gorgeous sights in all the food kingdom. Look at that. So beautiful. So I went ahead and I trimmed that up and was able to finally remove the plastic. And at that point, you can go ahead and cut this to any shape you want. I'll be going with the traditional square. And by the way, you're going to see all kinds of tricks online about the best way to cut this. Everybody and their uncle's got their own little trick. But for me, just a long, thin, serrated knife is the best. And while you really don't have to have wafer paper to make taroni, as you can see, it really does allow us to make beautiful, clean cuts. So we'll go ahead and cut that into perfectly uniform squares. And I did say perfect. So if you have to trim a little bit off the end, that's fine. And then we can go ahead and just discard that piece into our mouth. And that's it. Your torone is ready to enjoy. And not only does it look like one of the best things you've ever seen, the taste and texture are incredible. I mean, it's basically kind of firm and dry to the touch. And yet at the same time, it's kind of soft, flexible, and chewy. It seems impossible, but it's not. I mean, check it out. Even out of focus, you can tell how good that's going to be. And as you can see, I think we have the absolute perfect nut to nougat ratio. So anyway, that's it, how to make your own taroni. This would obviously be great to serve for Valentine's Day. Or better yet, instead of making it for, why don't you make this with that certain somebody? I mean, I don't know about you, but I can't think of a better way to spend an hour and a half with your Valentine that will be as pleasurable and as satisfying as this, okay? So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Peach gelé, or jelly, depends on what part of France you're from. What this is is a very intense jellied fruit candy, really fun to make. I don't make a lot of candy, but this is one I do enjoy making. So here's how you do it. So I need one pound of fresh peach. All right, get something really ripe and sweet. To that, I'm going to add some fresh lime juice. You can use lemon if you want, but I like the lime. So a tablespoon of that. And then we're going to puree that in the blender until very, very, very smooth. Okay? So once that is all pureed, I'm going to add that to a heavy bottom saucepan. Use something good quality. You don't want this scorching on the bottom. All right, I'm going to add a portion of the sugar. I'm going to bring that to a boil on medium-high heat. And we're just going to basically cook this stirring with a spatula about 15 minutes until it begins to thicken. Basically, we're evaporating water out of there and concentrating the peach down to like a really thick paste. Now, as this is cooking, you got to be really careful. Peach gelée is a cruel mistress, and it will bubble up and splatter on you and burn you severely. So be very careful. Adjust your flame. You want it boiling. You want it simmering. You want it reducing, but you don't want it going too high where it's actually like splattering out of the pot. All right, so 15 minutes later, mine looked like that. You can see it's like significantly thicker. I'm going to add the rest of the sugar. This is not a fruit salad. It's a candy. So, of course, we're going to use lots of sugar. And I'm going to stir that in, which will dissolve pretty quickly. And then the last ingredient, liquid pectin. Liquid pectin, that's what's going to really give this that beautiful jelly texture. So once the rest of the sugar's in and the pectin, I'm going to bring that back to a simmer. I want you to get this up to about 205 degrees. And once it gets up there, I want you to cook it for another 10 minutes. And again, I'm stirring with a spatula just like the first time. And 10 minutes later, you're going to have something that looks like this. Now at that point, turn off the heat, you're done. Although I did one extra step here, totally optional. I wanted the color to be a little deeper, a little darker, a little more intense. So I put a couple drops of red food coloring, all natural, which I thought gave it kind of a cool color. You can leave yours natural, doesn't matter. All right, I was just going for something, I don't know, a little peachier. I'm going to pour that into a plastic wrap lined 8x8 baking dish. I'm going to even it out, and we're going to give it the rare combination shake a shake a tapa tapa That's right, the old tapa tapa along with a shake a shake You're welcome. So let it cool to room temperature, wrap it up, refrigerate overnight, or until completely firm. All right, it takes a while. Once it's refrigerated until firm, I'm going to unwrap. I'm going to dust with sugar. Very important. I'll tell you why in a minute. I'm going to dust the surface, which I'm using a Silpat, silicone baking mat. I'm going to dust that with sugar. 
I'm going to invert it. So now I got sugar on sugar, which is going to help it not stick. This stuff is sticky. So the sugar will help it glide on the surface. I'm going to carefully peel off the plastic. I'm going to sugar that side. And I'm just using regular white granulated sugar. Once that's sprinkled, I'm going to trim the edges just to make it all, you know, perfect and beautiful. And you can cut these as big or small as you want. I think I did like, I don't know, 20, 24 maybe. And that sugar really helps the knife go through. It makes for really cool, clean cuts. And also, it gives it that kind of signature look, the jellied kind of side, and then the sugar top and bottom. And what's even better, after you cut these, all right, and you flip them over, the other side looks really beautiful because it's been sort of pressed in. So once you cut them, flip them over, and they all will look perfect and uniform. Very cool. And that's it. Look at that. Peach gelée. Very intense, super concentrated peach flavor. That beautiful, jellied, sticky, firm inside. And then that little bit of crispiness from the granulated sugar on the outside. What a great candy. All right, like I said, I don't make a lot of candy, but this is a really nice fresh fruit based candy. Perfect time of year to do it, end of summer. So I hope you give that a try. All the specific measurements are on foodwishes.com. You need those. All right, so go check that out. And as always, enjoy. Candied Citron. That's right, I'm going to show you how to candy your own citrus zest, and not just any citrus zest. We're using this, the most exotic and fragrant of all the citrus, Buddha's Hand, which you have to admit is a pretty cool name, although I would have called it Canary Squid Fruit. And by the way, if you're about to turn off the video because you're thinking, I can't get that, don't worry, this works with any citrus. So if you can't get the Buddha's Hand, this is totally going to work with things like lemons and oranges. So let me show you how to do this, and for the first step, we have to cut up our citrus. So I'm going to take one of these Buddha's hands and cut it in half. And as you can see, it's pretty much the zest on the outside and then like a white pith on the inside. And for this, you can basically use everything. Obviously, if you're doing oranges or lemons, you're just going to use the peel. And what I'm going to do is actually cube this up, but I'm going to save some of the ends of the fingers and I'm going to candy those whole just for a little variation. So I'm going to reserve some of those fingertips. And with the rest of it, I'm simply going to cube it up into, I don't know, they say you should go about half inch cubes. I believe these are a little smaller, more like 3 eighths probably. But anyway, you know our system when dicing and cubing. Pick a size and stick with it. And if possible, try to get it where every little piece has some zest attached, which is really not that hard if you cut it similar to what you see here. So I went ahead and cut up my citrus. Like I said, I'm going to have both cubed and fingertips. And then once our fruit's cut up, before we candy it, we're going to blanch it in boiling water. This is going to remove a lot of that bitterness. So when we eventually get to the final candied product, we'll have something that's sweet and tart, but it won't have that really strong bitter aftertaste, okay? So what we'll do is we'll bring some plain water to a boil, and we'll go ahead and we'll add our diced citrus to it, and we'll give that a stir, and we'll wait for that to come back to the simmer, and then all we'll do is we'll adjust our heat and simmer that on medium for about 30 minutes. Just give it a stir once in a while, and we'll let it simmer, like I said, for 30 minutes, after which we're gonna strain it carefully. We'll let that drain for a minute, and then we'll transfer that right back into the pot, at which point it's ready to be candied in a simple syrup, both literally and figuratively. So to our blanched citrus, we're going to add some sugar. Oh yeah, a lot of sugar. And some water. And we'll set our heat to medium high, and we will bring that up to a simmer, stirring occasionally. So, so far you have to admit a pretty simple operation. Okay, so that's one way you can do it. And that would be the standard way. But during my research, I read that some people don't think you should blanch Buddha's hand. So I decided to do a test batch without blanching it. So this Buddha's hand you see right here has just been cut. It has not been blanched. And I'm going to go ahead and add the sugar in the water just like we did on the last batch. And what these folks theory was is that Buddha's hand is not as bitter as other citrus like lemon and orange. And since it does have such a unique fragrant flavor, they think you're going to lose some of that if you blanch it first. So I decided to try it both ways. And on the blog post, I will give you my detailed report on which one was better. But the key thing to remember, whether you blanch your citrus first or not, the rest of this procedure is exactly the same, which means you're going to bring your fruit and simple syrup up to a simmer, and then we're going to lower our heat down to about medium, and we're going to cook that, stirring occasionally, 
until it reaches a temperature of 230 degrees. And how do you know when you get there? You have to use a digital thermometer. There are other ways, but not good ones. So you need a thermometer in the kitchen anyway. So if you are going to make this and don't have one, this would be the perfect opportunity. And obviously as it cooks, that water is going to start evaporating. That sugar syrup is going to thicken up a little bit. Right, those little cubes of citrus are definitely going to take on a different appearance. So you can see me giving mine a test here. And when it does reach 230 degrees, it should look something very similar to this. So like I said, you do need a thermometer, but other than that, a very, very simple procedure. And then all we need to do is let that sit and cool down to room temperature. So that was pretty easy. And then I did the exact same thing with those fingertips I saved, which I thought would look very cool, kept in their whole state. So I candied those in the syrup to 230 degrees, just like the cubes. I let it cool. Then I went ahead and packed it in one of these little latch top jars. Check it out. Guess what I'm going to call that? With apologies to the Rolling Stones, I'm going to be giving this out as Sticky Fingers. Hey, some of these names just write themselves. And by the way, that syrup it's packed in, oh man, that's perfect for cocktails. Or at least that's what people tell me. But anyway, besides the classic candied citrus, which I'm about to show you, I thought that would make a nice little alternative product. And to use that, I'll just fish it out and chop it up. Maybe serve it with some cannoli. Maybe put it in a scone. I haven't decided yet. So that was bonus coverage of my sticky fingers. But now let's switch back to the classic candied citrus technique. So for that, what we want to do is strain those pieces from the syrup. And once most of that syrup has dripped off, we're going to transfer those onto some kind of screener rack. Because what we need to do is dry these out for 24 hours at least before we sugar them. Now I know some people like to sugar them and then dry them. I don't. I like to spread them out in a single layer on some kind of rack like this. And just let them sit out at room temperature drying for at least 24 hours. And during that time, they're going to partially dry out. The surface is going to go from wet and sticky to something more tacky. And once those have been dried for a day on our rack, we can go ahead and toss those in some plain white sugar. As you can see, the freakishly small wooden spoon does a beautiful job at this. Now, once this stuff is coated with sugar, it's pretty much ready to use, except I do like to let it dry one more time, coated with the sugar just like that. I like to let it sit out for a couple hours before I package it, just to be safe. Although technically, it's ready to eat right now. And let me tell you, if you use the Buddha's hand, you are in for a treat. It really is such an interesting flavor and aroma. And as far as texture goes, you have that classic combination of the crispy sugar crystals on the outside and that softer dried fruit jelly type inside. Just so good. And above and beyond texture and taste, they just look really cool. Except for this one. Kind of had like a little weird sugar crystal on it. I better eat that one. But anyway, that's it. Candied Citron. So if you're looking for a very interesting gift for the foodie who has everything, I really hope you give this a try. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Grandma's peanut butter fudge. That's right, my grandma did not make peanut butter fudge, but many other grandmas did. And I'm pretty sure theirs was very close to this old fashioned style recipe. And besides being incredibly fast and easy to make, with the holidays approaching, this stuff would make a great edible gift. Unless, of course, that person has a peanut allergy, which would then make this a really terrible gift. But anyway, you could use the same technique for other nuts. And no matter what you use, this is how we're going to put it together. And first off, we're going to need to sift a pound of powdered sugar, which I'm going to do by shaking and stirring through this fine mesh strainer. And by the way, never assume anything in the kitchen. Okay, I thought that bag I poured in was one pound, but it was actually a pound and a half. And it was a good thing I double checked the package, because a pound and a half would have been way too much. So I ended up having to take some out. But all's well that ends well. And then what we'll do once that's set is move on to, I guess, what we'll call the wet ingredients, which will include some unsalted butter, as well as some creamy style peanut butter. And for this, I recommend you use an actual real peanut butter. Right, the only ingredients on the label should be peanuts and salt. So I generally will stay away from those major commercial brands that contain lots of sweeteners and stabilizers and emulsifiers and things we can't pronounce. And then what we'll do once those have been transferred into a saucepan is head to the stove and place this over medium heat. And as this comes up to temperature and starts to melt, we'll go ahead and give it a stir. And once the mixture is all looking nice and smooth, all we're waiting for is it to start to kind of simmer around the edges. Okay, we really don't need a rolling boil here. We just need everything nice and hot. So as soon as that starts to bubble around the sides of the pan and looks a little something like this, what we'll do is turn off the heat and add our last two ingredients, which will be a nice big pinch of salt, as well as some real pure vanilla extract. And we'll go ahead and stir that in. 
And then what we'll do once all that's been mixed together is quickly, but very carefully pour this into our bowl of sugar. And then using some kind of large spatula or spoon, we will simply mix this until very well combined. And by very well combined, I mean all our powdered sugar disappears, which is gonna be pretty easy if you sifted your sugar first, which we did. But anyway, we will go ahead and spatulate that until the mixture is extremely smooth. Oh, and speaking of smooth, I know I said to use creamy peanut butter in this, but I should mention if you did wanna use the chunky style, you can. It will still work, so feel free. I mean, you are after all the judge duty of your fudge duty, but personally, I do prefer the smooth melt in your mouth texture. But anyway, what we'll do once that's all mixed is go ahead and transfer it into a plastic lined, hopefully eight by eight inch baking dish. And we'll go ahead and press that down firmly, getting it as even as we can. At which point, all we have to do is wrap this up and then wait for it to get firm enough to cut. And it's at this stage, I always seem to make the same mistake. Okay, I always intend to pop it in the fridge for a few minutes to firm it up, but end up leaving it in there too long and it's ice cold. Which means when I pull it out and unwrap it to cut it, it tends to be extra brittle and flaky. Okay, so for a little tip, either don't chill it so much, or if you do make it ahead, pull it out and let it warm up a little bit before you cut it. But anyway, temperature issues aside, we'll go ahead and cube that up into whatever size pieces we want. Oh, and by the way, this cutting while cold issue is only a problem with this old fashioned style fudge. Okay, your modern creamier style peanut butter fudge is much softer and a lot easier to cut but as far as I'm concerned, is not nearly as good texturally. Okay, a classic peanut butter fudge is supposed to melt on your tongue, not smear on your tongue. Okay, if I want something soft and sticky and creamy, I'll just have a spoon of peanut butter. Okay, what we're going for here is something that has a very dense, firm texture, like a classic chocolate fudge, but as soon as it hits our warm tongue, it instantly melts into this buttery, peanutty liquid goodness, which is exactly what we have here. And by the way, if you did want something softer and creamier, all you gotta do is add a little more peanut butter. And I'll try to remember to mention that in the blog post. But anyway, I went ahead and finished cutting this up. And as this warmed up, it did get easier to cut. And eventually, once that was cut, I transferred it into a candy dish. And then sort of surprised myself by eating several more pieces. Since I'm generally not big on sweets and candies. But there's just something about this I really love and find fairly addictive. But anyway, that's it what I'm calling grandma's peanut butter fudge. Again, to be clear, not my grandma, but somebody's grandma. And like I said, with the holidays coming up, if you're looking for a very easy, crowd-pleasing gift, or maybe just to bring to that thing where everybody's supposed to bring something, you know those things, and this thing is perfect for those. But no matter what occasion you make these for, or whether you're just gonna treat yourself, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Chocolate bark. That's right, usually my bark is worse than my bite, but not this time. And besides biting this bark for your own personal pleasure, this beautiful and easy to make confection would make a great edible holiday gift which, as we've discussed in the past, is a great way to show people we care about them without spending the money that proves it. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And the first thing we need to figure out is exactly what we're gonna to add to our chocolate. And for this version, I'm gonna be going with the following three ingredients. And those would be some pistachio nuts. And these have been shelled, roasted, and salted. We're also gonna go with some of these beautiful dried goji berries, which if I'm not mistaken, are the berry of the goji tree, or shrub, or plant. I've never seen one, but they're very delicious and very festive looking. And then last but not least, I'm also gonna go with some toasted walnuts. And then if we want, we can also include one optional ingredient. And that would be a little sprinkling of extra coarse sea salt, which I think is a nice touch. And then once we have all that stuff decided on, we can move on to the most important ingredient, our chocolate. And what I have here are six four ounce bars of dark chocolate, that is 70% cacao. And you could go with a little lower percentage of cacao, but I am recommending something between 60 and 70% cacao. And I mention that mostly because I really enjoy saying the word cacao. And what we need to do before we temper our chocolate is go ahead and chop this into small pieces, which is not that hard. The most difficult part is not having it fly all over as you cut, and also trying not to eat too much as you do it. But anyway, we're gonna go ahead and chop up a pound and a half of dark chocolate, and then we're gonna separate it into one third and two thirds portions. 
Because while making this, I wanted to test out a shortcut method for tempering the chocolate, which involves us melting two thirds of the chocolate and then stirring the one third portion into that. Okay, the classic professional way is we melt and heat the chocolate to a very specific temperature and then we cool it down and heat it back up. So instead of that, I decided to try this sounds too good to be true method to hopefully achieve the same results. So I'm gonna go ahead and add two thirds of our chocolate to this bowl. And we're just gonna do this by eye. And like I said, we will reserve one third of the chocolate to add later. And to melt the chocolate, what we'll do is heat up a couple inches of water until it just barely starts to simmer. And then we'll reduce our heat to low and place a bowl over the top to create what we call in the business a double boiler. And by the way, be sure your heat's on the lowest possible setting. And then what we'll do is add our two thirds portion into that and basically stand there and watch it melt. And we're not gonna stir this until we think approximately two thirds of the chocolate is melted. All right, give or take, which for me looked to be about right here. Although it's hard to see with all that glare. And what we'll do when it reaches that point is give it a stir with our silicone spatula. And we'll keep it over low heat, stirring occasionally until all that chocolate's melted and the mixture feels hot to the touch. Okay, not super hot, like hot bath water. Okay, about 115, 120 degrees is good. So I tested that with my finger and it was hot to the touch. And once it does reach that point, we'll go ahead and add the one third of the chocolate we reserved and we'll give that a quick stir. And then just as soon as that's been stirred in, to finish this up, what we'll do is remove this from the heat, set it down on the table and basically let it cool down stirring occasionally until it's cool to the touch. And by then all your chocolate will have melted and you should have a very smooth, very shiny bowl of melted chocolate. And by the way, I should have already mentioned the whole idea with tempering the chocolate is so that once it firms back up, it keeps a nice firm snappy texture and not a soft waxy texture. Okay, when we break a piece of this, it should snap like our original bar of chocolate. So I kept stirring and testing with my finger until I thought it had cooled down enough. And I probably should have let it go on farther until it started to thicken up a little bit, but I'm sort of impatient. Plus the sun was going down. So I decided mine was cool enough and proceeded to pour that onto my line baking sheet. And I'm using a silicone mat here, but parchment paper or plastic wrap will work also. But anyway, I went ahead and poured my chocolate on, like I said, probably a little too soon. And then what we'll do while this stuff is still wet is sprinkle over our toppings. So I started with my walnuts, which as you can see, I chopped up. All right, I'm gonna leave my dried goji berries whole, but I did decide to chop up my walnuts and pistachios. So how much or even if you're gonna chop this stuff is up to you. All right, that's all gonna depend on the texture and appearance of the surface you're going for. So you decide. You are after all the Bob Marley of how gnarly to make your bark. But as you can see, I did chop mine up pretty well. And besides whether to chop or not, you also have to decide how much to put on. All right, some people go for almost completely full coverage, but personally, I do like to see a good amount of chocolate, but I was still pretty generous. And then once my fruit and nuts were applied, I finished up with a light sprinkling of our sea salt. And that is it. All we need to do is let this cool down and harden up, which should happen right on the tabletop. But again, I was worried about my light, so I cheated and popped mine in the fridge for a few minutes, at which point I pulled it out and it looked like this. And I have to be honest, I was a little concerned because it wasn't that shiny. So I really wasn't sure at this point if that shortcut tempering method worked. But as I started to break this up, it actually felt pretty good. and was snapping apart in nice clean pieces. Although it does help that this was cold. But later, even at room temp, it did break up pretty cleanly. And if you hold it at the right angle, the surface did have a little bit of sheen to it, which is a good sign. So I will deem the shortcut tempering method acceptable. But having said that, I'm also gonna provide links in the blog post to the actual professional tempering method in case you want to use that. Because that'll produce a bark that comes out even shinier and crisper. But anyway, I went ahead and finished breaking that up. Some people like to cut it, but I think the irregular broken pieces look much better and way more bark-like. And that's it, once that's portioned up, we can transfer that into some kind of attractive serving vessel and enjoy our fruity nutty chocolate bark, which obviously can be made with a million different combinations of toppings. But having said that, these three work very well especially with that little touch of sea salt. And as I mentioned, the whole point of that tempering step is so you can snap the chocolate like this. Okay, it's not like it's gonna be terrible if it's soft, 
But if you temper, the texture is going to be much nicer and more like a piece of nice chocolate versus a piece of cheap chocolate. So let me go ahead and try one more piece before I move along and remind you what a great edible gift this would make. Presented in some type of festive container, preferably with a bow. And that, my friends, would make one very nice edible gift. And remember what we say when it comes to giving edible gifts. We're not cheap. We're creative. But anyway, that's it. A holiday-themed chocolate bark. Like I said, I wanted to try that shortcut tempering method, which did work out pretty good. But like I said, in the blog post, I will provide links to show you how to do it for real. But either way, professional method or shortcut, whether you're making this for yourself or for a gift, or both, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Enjoy.